Hi everyone, and thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Eliza Gutierrez Dewar, and I am streaming in from my Los Angeles home office. Uh, I'm a consultant for the geodesign team in Esri's Professional Services, as well as the product owner for ArcGIS Geo Planner. So despite the irregular year and this change of venue and format, I'm really excited to be with all of you to discuss conservation planning along with some of the tools we might use to undertake this type of planning process. Now, it won't surprise most of you to hear that we face big problems in our world today. The fight between our world's diminishing natural resources and society's growing needs has led us to what many view as the tipping point. We see the impact of the strain every day in our headlines, raging wildfires, extreme storms, persistent droughts, and rapid wildlife decline. And, and those are just a few examples. Increasing climate change and biodiversity loss threaten the stability and safety of our everyday lives. We're at a point as a global community where we can address the growing issues we face and work to repair them or continue on the current trajectory and cause irreversible damage. But this is a tipping point, which means that there is work that we can do to address these threats. Across the globe, various initiatives set standards and goals to combat these issues. A major trend in these initiatives is to conserve a certain percentage of area for biodiversity. Scientist and humanitarian E.O. Wilson created and popularized the global Half-Earth Project, which calls us to protect half the land and sea in order to manage sufficient habitat to reverse the species extinction crisis and ensure the long-term health of our planet. Similarly, the Weiss Campaign for Nature has called nations to set new global biodiversity targets and commit to conserving 30% of areas by the year 2030. At the end of 2020, California's Governor Gavin Newsom issued an executive order where he calls for the goal of protecting 30% of the state by 2030. And even a couple weeks ago, as I was preparing for this presentation, the new Biden administration issued a similar executive order taking up this call and committing to the goal of, per of conserving 30 by 30. So we're seeing this trend taking off, which makes this a really exciting time to have this conversation with you all. So if we accept the call to conserve 30% of land and water or half in the case of half earth, the question becomes how? How do we prioritize, weigh, and select what areas to protect? Now the answer might not come as a surprise to many of you. The answer is an iterative, geographically informed, and holistic planning process. The answer is geodesign. In a geodesign framework, planners and decision, make decision makers can analyze and understand given conditions before testing alternative responses to their planning questions. And once these decisions have been vetted, then we can move into action. And geodesign can be used to address the calls to action of the Half Earth Project, Global 30 by 30 Initiatives, and California's 30 by 30 Initiative. These conservation goals are achievable. Let's take the example of California. Let's start by looking at the current conditions. California's protected lands currently make up 50% of the state, as shown by the map on the left. This is a higher number than we would expect, but it is also misleading. Not all protected lands protect for biodiversity. Protection levels are referred to as gap statuses. A gap status of one or two does protect for biodiversity, but a gap status of three or four does not. These protected lands could still allow for mining, milling, and other natural resource extraction. So that's not what we have in mind when we talk about biodiversity protection. With this in mind, California currently only protects 22% of the state with a gap status of one or two, as we see in the map on the right. This is the number that we care about, and this is a number that we aim to raise to 30%. And we're not that far. If a third of the gap three and four areas were upgraded to conservation practices that do protect for biodiversity, we would easily hit our target. So let's discuss how to decide where to fo focus our conservation efforts by taking the geodesign framework and applying it to conservation planning. We'd start with an inventory of current conditions as they relate to a certain conservation goal, 30 by 30. We would then assemble relevant data sets such as biodiversity, land use, and carbon mass. We can then move into exploring the land we could conserve, considering constraints and factors that would impact planning. Working with now that data-rich foundation, we can move into switching to mapping areas of value for conservation. If these mapped areas meet our defined goals, we can then move towards implementing this conservation plan. So let's put this process into action and focus on the county of San Bernardino in California. To begin this process, we must first map existing assets. To do this, we're going to hop into the app ArcGIS GeoPlanner. GeoPlanner will allow us to map and analyze our study area as well as plan and prioritize areas for conservation. 
All right, so here we are in ArcGIS GeoPlanner. And before we get started with our San Bernardino example, I want to just quickly recap some things about California. We're currently looking at gap status areas of one through four. And these are areas that don't necessarily actually protect for biodiversity, although they are considered protected. Instead, what we want to focus on are these, our gap statuses of one and two. These are the areas that matter for biodiversity as they protect for them. These are the areas that we want to focus on when we're looking in San Bernardino and in local areas. All right, so let's zoom into San Bernardino and get started with this example. San Bernardino is an interesting county because it's the largest county in the United States and has a lot of land. Therefore, there is a lot of variation in terms of the habitat, ecosystems, and just general land cover that you can find. But let's start with looking at what we have currently. If we look at the mapped areas with protection statuses one through four, we actually see a large amount. 80% of the county is currently considered protected. But we know that we want to focus on those gap statuses of one and two, so let's take a look at that. 42% of the county is currently protected under gap statuses of one and two. So these are the areas that are protected in a way that would protect for biodiversity. But it actually raises an interesting point about where do we put those areas and why do we put them there? By putting an area that is protected for biodiversity does not create biodiversity in that area. So we have to be strategic about where we actually put protected areas. And with San Bernardino being such a large county, there's a lot of variation across the county in terms of biodiversity, species richness, and protected areas. So to get a better sense of San Bernardino as a whole, let's take a look at land cover. In the southern western most portion of the county, we see a lot more variation in terms of land cover. These are the areas of the Inland Empire where we have a lot more development and cities and just general kind of more urban living. And slightly north of that, we have the San Bernardino National Forest where we find Mount Baldy, Big Bear, Lake Arrowhead, a lot of um, natural areas that we can see represented in green. And then when we get a little bit further north and into the east of the county, we see a lot of the same, although you do have a few you know, highways cutting through there with a few belts of red, but for the most part, we see a lot of the same types of land cover. So if we take a look at those protected areas, we'll actually see that they overlap largely with these areas with redundant land cover types. But land cover is not the only indicator for biodiversity importance or where we should be directing our biodiversity protection practices. So instead, Let's actually turn off land cover and take a look at a layer called species richness. So here we have the species richness map. Areas that are brighter and have higher values show higher species richness and higher biodiversity importance. So looking at the county of San Bernardino, we can see a hot spot in the southern portion of the county. And in the northern and eastern sections, we can see a little bit less variation in color, meaning a little bit less value in terms of biodiversity. And if we look at our protected areas, we can see that the areas that are protected overlap with areas that don't have as much biodiversity. And these hotspots that we see in the southern portions don't have any protections. So this should kind of raise some questions about where is biodiversity protection coming from and kind of why are certain areas being chosen to be protected if the most biodiverse and species rich part of the county doesn't have any protections for biodiversity but we have a lot of areas protected that are lower in value, what's the benefit and what's the missed opportunity? But let's take a look at another data set relevant to biodiversity. This is a data set for intact habitat cores maintained by Esri's Green Infrastructure Initiative. So here we can see large pieces of land that are intact natural systems. This is a really valuable data set to look at potential areas to protect. Some of these areas already are protected, but not all of them are. So this is sort of a jumping off point to think about where else could we protect. Here, areas in darker green are considered cores with more value. So again, in the northeastern portion where we have those protected areas, the cores are you know, present and they are still valuable, but they're not quite as valuable as this southern portion where we aren't seeing the protection statuses for biodiversity. Now, the last layer that I want to take a look at before we move into the more designing process is a suitability layer. 
Now through GeoPlanner, you're able to use the modeler tool in order to create a weighted raster overlay model. A weighted raster overlay model brings together multiple image layers and allows you to give them weights and scores to create an output image layer. This is really valuable if you have multiple image layers and data layers that you want to be able to reference as you go and design, but you need to be able to incorporate it into one layer. In this example model, I brought in carbon biomass, bioclimate, ecophysiographic diversity, and population as factors to consider when we are designing. So with this hypothetical suitability modeler, we're even also seeing the same trend that in the southern portion of the map, there's a lot more value for habitat suitability. And in the northern and eastern portions of the map, there's a little bit less. So let's actually zoom into this hotspot and take a look at how we could do some conservation planning to preserve the biodiversity in this specific area that is shown to have value. So we're now focused on the extent of the Bear Creek watershed. This watershed includes Big Bear Lake, as well as some skiing, some, some different towns, a lot of tourism, as well as clearly a lot of species importance. So we have an opportunity here to talk about how conservation could be used to protect the species richness and biodiversity from competing societal threats. We've already toured a lot of the layers that we are going to use to guide our design process. But once again, let's just review what protections exist in the Bear Creek watershed. And we're gonna do this very quickly just by opening up our dashboard and taking a look at this first design chart. This design chart is currently assessing our study area of the Bear Creek watershed. And by looking at the USA protected areas with the gap status of one through four, we can see that 70% of our study area has a gap status of three and 30% has no data at all. So this is not anywhere near our biodiversity targets. And let's take a look at the rest of the dashboard before moving into our design process. Currently the Bear Creek biodiversity protection shows that we have no acres of biodiversity protection. The Bear Creek 30 by 30 target shows us that we are no closer to our 30% goal. And then we have some other general information as well as information on San Bernardino. But let's dock this at the bottom as we will now move towards designing in our Bear Creek watershed. And to do this, I'm gonna turn on a zoning layer for the Bear Creek watershed taken from the San Bernardino zoning layer. Now we see a lot of this green color and I wanna show you what this reads as. Currently this is called resource conservation and this is the zoning term taken from San Bernardino. But resource conservation does not necessarily mean that it is at the standard that we expect for biodiversity protection. For this reason, in our design palette, we have a new land use type specifically called biodiversity protections. And this will ensure that in our land use planning process, we are giving the proper attention to these areas for biodiversity protection. Now to make it a little bit easier to take a look at the species richness layer underneath, I'm gonna apply a transparency to our land use layer. And in order to allow myself later to compare the progress that we make from the as is situation to our proposed situation, I'm gonna switch into a proposed condition scenario and do my designs here. So now taking a look at the underlying species layer, I'm gonna to start to design. And as I'm reclassifying the parcels of the zoning area, I'm making an effort to follow the bright yellow patches from the species richness layer underneath. As I'm doing this, we can see already that the KPIs, key performance indicators of this dashboard are updating. With just a few minor modifications, we've actually already been able to increase our overall 30 by 30 goal to 24% of that 30%. So let's make the effort to hit that 30 by 30 goal. I switch into the drawing tool where I'm able to freehand polygons and shapes wherever I want. This way I'm able to more precisely trace the outlines of the specific hotspots that I see from the species richness layer. And with one final reclassification, we've hit that 30% goal. 
And so now what comes next? If in theory we have met this 30 by 30 goal or the 30% planning goal, where should we go next? Well, in terms of the conservation planning process, we must analyze constraints and threats. And to do this, GeoPlanner has an easy to use project screening tool. The project screening tool allows you to take certain data layers that might be considered positive or negative flags and enter them as criteria against your design layer. So in our case, we're going to use potential habitat loss as a threat that we're going to consider for our conservation planning. We've already taken a look at the intact habitat cores layer. Also developed as part of this initiative were the intact habitat cores projected for 2050. This shows maintained habitat cores as well as gained habitat cores and also lost habitat cores in red. So if we focus on that layer of lost habitat cores, we can use this as a screen to make sure that we are protecting our habitat in any areas that might lose habitat over the next few years. So to do this, we're going to configure our screening criteria. Specifically focused around resource conservation and areas that we could have targeted for biodiversity protections, but potentially have missed. For our layers, we're going to focus on the habitat loss in Bear Creek, and we're going to find areas that intersect these two items. And then we'll click run. This allows us to better understand our designs after we have created them. This is perfect for environmental screening processes or when you have a certain set of criteria that you know your project needs to meet or that it cannot meet. So there are a few areas of habitat loss that we haven't quite picked up in with our conservation areas. So we can now go back to our land use and better target these areas. Because these areas are so small, we're going to up our transparency even further and focus on those areas for biodiversity protection. And now this is just one way that we met our 30 by 30 goal, but there's clearly other ways we could have gone about designing this. By creating new scenarios, we can start fresh and design in a new workspace without compromising our previous designs. We can also use this mechanism to engage with other designers and invite them into our workspace and allow them the opportunity to design their own scenarios. Once we have multiple scenarios that we can design and compare metrics, we can pick the best option for our problem. In this demo, we saw an example of how the geodesign process can be applied towards conservation planning in order to meet biodiversity goals such as 30 by 30. The geodesign framework is flexible and can be applied beyond conservation planning specifically. Whether it is rural community planning in the face of economic and environmental uncertainties in Idaho, or disaster preparedness and resilient design for an at-risk Florida Air Force Base, the geodesign framework can be applied for better decision making. And these are only a handful of examples on the screen of successful geodesign projects from previous summits. Throughout today and tomorrow, we'll continue to hear how this framework can be applied to a diverse array of issues. And as you think of your individual place of work or study, continue to imagine how geodesign can carry your work further. We've spent the last seven or so years building Geoplanner, refining the process, and, and working with all of you. It is really exciting to now be on the cusp of projects like 30 by 30 and Half Earth, where we can apply everything that we have learned. With GeoPlanner, Living Atlas, and ArcGIS as a whole, we have the tools and knowledge to make an impact in the world. And it's a question of whether or not we're ready to, to try. Thank you all so much for taking the time and joining me today. I hope you enjoy the remainder of the summit and, and join me in finding inspiration to tackle your specific geodesign problems. So. Thank you uh, and take care.